Medistand. Understanding Medicine. I am Professor Azizur Rahman, and today we are going to discuss some antihypertensive agents, their characteristics, their profiles, because uh, you know in most guidelines they just mention different drugs and. I think uh, if you know these drugs better, you can understand their application better. So this lecture is going to be like on applied pharmacology and there will be mostly clinically oriented talk, but I will highlight the uh, role of various antihypertensive agents and how they can be used in an individual patients. Uh, we have many classes one of the very old classes and uh, very popular classes is thiazide type of diuretics and every drug has got a plus point and negative point i will highlight all those now to understand the mechanism of action of thiazide you need to understand this nephron you know this is the glomerulus and the proximal tubules and then loop of Henle and then distal convoluted tubules and ultimately collecting ducts. So glomerular filtrate passes through the nephrons and the most of sodium and water is actually reabsorbed. And that is because we need the sodium and water. But when there is too much sodium and water in the body resulting in hypertension, maybe we can get rid of some salt and some water and that will lower blood pressure. That is exactly what the thiazides they do. They prevent reabsorption of sodium from the distal convoluted tubules somewhere here. Most of the sodium is actually already reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted, convoluted tubules. So very little is left and that will be prevented from being absorbed by thiazides and that is how they cause a blood pressure lowering effect. They would cause very mild gentle diuresis and would cause drop in blood pressure. Uh, the members of thiazides are hydrochlorothiazide which is very popular and very cheap drug and then we have chlorothalidone. Chlorothalidone is generally more recommended over hydrochlorothiazide because it is truly 24 hours action and this one does not have 24 hour action. The plus point of uh, in this class of drug, they are very cheap, mostly I think just a couple of rupees and they are proven beneficial in the very, very old studies on hypertension, whether treatment of hypertension with the thiazide prevents complication. It has been conclusively shown that they do prevent complications and they are one of the first lines and in fact many years they were the first line now they are one of the many other first line drugs you can still use them as first line or in combination and one beauty of thiazide type of diuretics is that they combine very well with another class of drug called ras blockers so i think this is another beauty because we often have to use drugs in combination and because of diuresis they would also be beneficial if somebody has concomitant heart failure. Uh, the, the downside is that being diuretic, they would cause some diuresis. But as I said, these are very mild diuretics. So I think this would not be very cumbersome. After a few day, first few days, there should be hardly any noticeable diuresis. They may cause hypokalemia and they may cause metabolic effects like dyslipidemia, increase in uric acid, increase in blood glucose. But these are generally very mild effects. And these days we use uh, diuretics in relatively smaller doses. So I think most patients would not develop clinically uh, relevant side effects of, from this drug. And they may also cause erectile dysfunction in men like actually many other antihypertensive drugs. Uh, then we have drugs belonging to the same family, but slightly different. That is why we call them thiazide type diuretics. They are called diuretics, but their diuretic effect is actually minimal. And this is they, their predominant action is through vasodilatation. So of course, vasodilatation will be also helpful to lower blood pressure. 
but they also some effect similar to thiazide type of diuretic thiazide diuretics so it's actually combined effect vasodilatation and net uresis and water uh, excretion we only have one member of this class that is indapamide and i am mentioning it as a separate uh, entity here because most guidelines they would recognize indapamide as better uh, thiazide drug and they would recommend that once thiazides are needed it is better to use indapamide because of some features which i'm just going to highlight they are very well tolerated and dapamide is very very uh, easy on stomach and the system hardly any side effect they whenever we use thiazides some of the guidelines especially the nice guidelines the very famous guidelines they would say that indapamide is a better thiazide because it works for 24 hours number 2 it, it has got no metabolic Uh, effects like on lipids or glucose and uric acid, uh, unlike thiazide diuretics. And downside, I think no no clinically significant side effect. Of course, every drug can have side effect, but generally, uh, indapamide is uh, without any significant downside. Then we have mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist. This is actually the drug which is not the first line it is usually used in stage 3 or stage 4 hypertension when their patients are refractory to uh, other drugs in fact only when somebody is refractory to refractory to three drug combo only then we use mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist but i am mentioning it here before ras blockers because they actually also work through the same kidneys so i think you can find and you can understand them better here they prevent sodium reabsorption from the distal convoluted tubules but from a site which is even further distal to the uh, the site where thiazide works so the effect is even milder because the most of the sodium is ab absorbed proximally so as you go distally less and less sodium is passing through the nephron and the effect of the blood pressure medicine will also be less and less so i think they are very mild drugs and they cause natuuresis and the class in this the, the two members of this class are spironolactone and aplerinone aplerinone is also now available in our country but spironolactone is very very old drug the plus side is they are useful for refractory hypertension when somebody is not responding to adequate adequate doses of three drugs like one of them being a ras blocker another being amlodipine and third being a thiazide or thiazide type diuretic and all drugs are taken and still blood pressure is more than 140 by 90 that is classified as a refractory hypertension that is where these mineral cord receptor antagonists they find their place they do not cause hypokalemia in fact they may cause hyperkalemia uh, and they cause very very gentle diuresis so hardly any issue diuresis is hardly an issue and they may cause hyperkalemia particularly if patient has some chronic kidney disease i think we need to be careful there and and patient should not be taking potassium supplements if you are giving mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists and this spironolactone it can cause some anti androgenic effect so that could be a problem in men it can cause gynecomastia it can cause erectile dysfunction there could be very distressing side effects so i think we need to be careful that is perhaps the reason why these drugs are not used as a first line drug uh i think before we talk about ras blockers we need to understand this system and i'm sure you have all read about it but let me just uh, uh, refresh your knowledge we have this excellent system called renin and eutensin and losterone system renin is produced by the kidneys usually in response to hypovolemia hyponatremia dehydration low cardiac output state and it release it 
converts angiotensin nogen from which comes from the liver into angiotensin 1 and then angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by uh, the enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme which is present uh, in the entire body but mostly in the lungs and this conversion makes the potent vasoconstricted angiotensin 2 which causes uh, vasoconstriction in arterioles so that would cause hypertension because this system is activated when there is hypotension so there will be vasoconstriction that, that the blood pressure will rise not only that this angiotensin will also stimulate aldosterone aldosterone will uh, retain sodium and water further elevating the blood pressure further restoring the reduced cardiac output so this is the system which actually keeps us alive and safe but when it is overactivated, it may be responsible for blood pressure and we have a number of strategies to, to counter its overactivation. For example, we could use angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. They would prevent conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 1 will be there, but it is not a potent vasoconstricted. It has got very mild action. So it will be as if there is no vasoconstrictor effect and we will stop, uh, we will have less of angiotensin 2. Uh, this also would have effect on the bradykinin. So bradykinin level will also be elevated. That will also contribute to blood pressure lowering effect, although that may be responsible for some of the side effects also. Then we have angiotensin receptor blockers. These are the drugs which they block the receptors of angiotensin 2 on the vessels. Uh, they, there are two types of receptors, AT1 and AT2. Uh, please don't confuse this AT1 with angiotensin 1. This is angiotensin 2 AT1, uh, type 1 receptor. So angiotensin 2 type 1 receptors, which are vasoconstrictor then angiotensin 2 type 2 receptor which are vasodilator so these drugs they they block the vasoconstrictor action and they stimulate vasodilator action so both will be helpful to reduce blood pressure then we have mineralocorticoid receptor agonists working here they will block the effect of aldosterone so we can use one or more of these strategies to lower the blood pressure to control overactivated RAS. Please note down, we do not normally use all of them. Uh, at least we do not combine these because there was a trial when they combined uh, these different drugs working at different levels of RAS to, to completely suppress the system and then it resulted in to more nephrotoxicity in those patients who already had existing kidney disease. Now, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, uh, this is the first class in this group. They block conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 as I was highlighted in the previous slide. They also increase bradykinin level. This would contribute to blood pressure lowering effect but also cause some of the side effects called uh, angioedema and the cough. The members in this class we have Captopril, we have lisinopril, we have enalapril, we have perindopril. Now all these drugs are still very popular. They are usually once a day very well tolerated and very very uh, safe drugs. And the good features are that they have proven cardiorenal benefits. Now of course any blood pressure lowering drug would benefit us uh, in the sense that it will reduce hypertension later complication but trials have shown that ACE inhibitors they extend cardiorenal benefits which are over and above through their blood pressure lowering effect so they have direct beneficial effects so that is why they are preferred in all newly diagnosed hypertensive patients who are younger than 55 so according to the new guidelines the nice guidelines the, the preferred agent for uh, the first line agent is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or ARBs. They combine well with thiazides and CCBs. This point I will discuss in one of the slides. 
what is the role of combination and also uh, they work very well in hard failure because they lower after load they lower preload and they also i think they are very useful in heart failure uh, so if somebody is hypertensive and there is heart failure also i think they would they should benefit from this class of drug the downside of ace inhibitors is they may cause hyperkalemia but in my experience this hyperkalemia can occur only if somebody has existing chronic kidney disease and in somebody who has normal kidneys i don't think there is any possibility of hyperkalemia or the other possibility is somebody is patient, somebody is taking potassium sparing diuretic so if you take these two, two precautions then hyperkalemia would not be an issue about 7 to 10% patient with who are on ace inhibitors they would develop cough this cough is typically dry very irritating patient would complain of this irritation in the throat and if you examine their chest chest should be absolutely normal because there is no physical abnormality in the in the lungs and there should be no expectoration now if somebody has expectoration somebody has some finding in the chest it is likely that the cause of cough is something else so i think you should not unnecessarily deprive your patients of the benefit of this drug if the patient has cough uh, but those who have no other cause but cough develops and cough is irritating then of course we need to withdraw this medicine and then this is the class effect of this uh, all these drugs if somebody develops cough due to one ace inhibitor it is very likely that he will develop the same with other ace inhibitors also then angioedema is a potentially serious complications uh, because it may cause uh, the swelling of the face it may cause the respiratory distress those patients who develop angioedema because of the bradykinin we immediately withdraw this drug and we put it in their file that they should never be given this class of drug again now we have angiotensin receptor blockers which you can consider as an improvement over uh, uh, the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors because they have almost the same benefits but no side effects or at least not that often uh, they block the action of angiotensin 2 the effect of angiotensin 2 on the arterioles by blocking angiotensin 2 subtype 1 receptors and also by stimulating angiotensin 2 subtype 2 receptors i already mentioned that 81 receptors are stimulatory vasoconstrictor and 82 are dilatory so with this action we will have blood pressure lowering effect and this effect is on both afferent as well as efferent vessels that means there will be reduction in blood pressure but there will be no edema formation uh, the members in this class we have nosartan we have velsartan and we have telmisartan and there's one called candesartan there are actually more but i have included only those which are commonly prescribed in our part of the world so i think if you are familiar with these four uh, you can apply the same knowledge on the others a good points the same as in ace inhibitors proven cardio renal benefits first line drugs in people who are younger than 55 and i like to make a point here that most patient with uh, hypertension they are diagnosed before the age of 55 so they it would constitute the first line treatment and like ace inhibitors arb is also combined very well with other antihypertensive drugs like thiazides and ccbs and also very useful in heart failure uh, the downside hyperkalemia similar to ace inhibitors again would occur only in those who have chronic kidney disease or those who are on potassium sparing drugs but cough and angioedema is not seen in with this drug but i think this uh, feature gives an edge of angiotensin receptor blockers over ace inhibitors the benefits are similar but the advantage is that there is no side effects
Now, effects of adrenergic stimulation. Uh, you know, we have sympathetic nervous system. Again, this slide will help you to understand the effect of beta blockers. Adrenergic receptors are of two types, alpha and beta, and there are some subtypes, alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2, but predominantly alpha are vasoconstrictor. In the peripheral vessels, alpha 1 is a vasoconstrictor. So if you use alpha blocker, you can expect blood pressure lowering effect. And beta receptors are on the heart, they have chronotropic effects and inotropic effect. Coronotropic means they increase heart rate and inotropic means they increase force of contraction. Now this may be of course needed in many situations, but when we give beta blocker by reducing chronotropy and by reducing inotropy, we can reduce cardiac output and we can lower blood pressure also. So this is how these drugs work. Uh, then beta adrenergic blockers, uh, mechanism of action, uh, block adrenergic receptors and reduce cardiac output. And that is how they work. And members are propranolol, which is the oldest non-selective uh, beta blocker. Non-selective means it would work on heart and bronchi. Uh, so it could cause bronchospasm. Atenolol, relative cardioselective. Boisoprol, further cardioselective, carvedilol, which is alpha blocker as well as beta blocker. It is classified as beta blocker, but it has got alpha effect also, alpha blocker uh, uh, capabilities also. In the beta, it is non-selective. Then we have the latest nebivolol, which is beta blocker as well as alpha, and in beta, it is cardioselective. So I think this much detail should be enough although we could talk longer. So they are very, very cheap drugs and they are very useful. Now, I think the most of the guidelines, they do not indicate, they do not mention beta blocker as a first line treatment. Although in the real world, beta blockers are still being used as first line treatment, especially in our country. Because they're very cheap and they're also very useful if there is existing, uh, coexisting ischemic heart disease, coexisting heart failure and they also work very well if there is sympathetic overdrive. Now sympathetic overdrive is a is a feature which can occur in some patients with hypertension. They have a lot of anxiety, palpitation, perspiration. I actually have a separate lecture on sympathetic overdrive but uh, here I would just like to mention that if somebody has sympathetic overdrive, beta blocker will be preferable. Most guidelines say that beta blocker can be used whenever there is a compelling indication at any level at stage one two three at any stage beta blockers can be used but they are usually used in small dose and they are usually used in addition to other antihypertensive drugs and these are the indications ischemic heart disease heart failure and sympathetic overdrive so fairly strong upper side the downside is that it may cause bronchospasm particularly if you use non-selective and particularly if patient is prone to develop asthma. So I think whenever we prescribe beta blockers, we ask about the history of asthma. If somebody is asthmatic, then we generally speaking do not prescribe beta blockers. But if there is a compelling indication, we would use a selective beta blocker. By that I mean it would have effect only on the heart. It would not cause bronchospasm and beta blockers are notorious to cause erectile dysfunction and but i like to mention here that the latest nebivolol because of its vasodilator action and that perhaps does not cause uh, erectile dysfunction more than uh, another any any antihypertensive drug can do in fact one of the studies have shown that it might actually improve existing erectile dysfunction so beta blockers like other drugs have a upper side and the downside as a physician you have to decide in which patient which side is stronger and would, would you go for beta blocker or you would not go for beta blocker now many times we use combinations although we have discussed the characteristics of various antihypertensive agents separately but when we combine them there sometimes their effects they 
they change because there is complementary action on the blood pressure and there may be some very nice cancellation effect on the side effects so i think i would briefly talk about some combinations also let's first talk about the combination of ras blockers and you know ras blocker could be ace inhibitors or arbs with thiazide type of diuretics or thiazides themselves uh, so we have combinations of any of the ras blockers or any of the thiazide or thiazide type ACE inhibitors, ARB is here and indepamide or hydrochlorothiazide combinations. And the members are parindopril and indepamide. These two are actually drugs from the same company. They make a combination. And because of the proprietary rules, uh, nobody else can combine this drug. So I think we have parindopril and indepamide, one combination. But hydrochlorothiazide is available with various ACE inhibitors and ARBs like Velsartan, Telmisartan. And interestingly, all these combo pills are available in various strengths, uh, small dose, moderate dose, and large dose. So if you want to use combination pills, you could start with a small dose and then move on to moderate dose and large dose. Patient will still be getting just one pill, but blood pressure lowering effect will of course in increase as you increase the dosage. Now this combination has got great plus point and these RAS blockers and thiazide type of diuretics, they have potent complementary blood pressure lowering effects. Because thiazides, they actually activate RAS. Once RAS is activated, anti-RAS would have more effect. So this is how their effect is complemented and their side effects are also cancelled. This is very interesting. You know that RAS blockers can cause hyperkalemia and diuretics, thiazide type of diuretics can cause hypokalemia. When both are combined, then though the side effect of hyper and hypokalemia are cancelled, so you don't need to worry about the potassium. Uh, the, the downside, I don't really see much of uh, downside as a combo. Of course, as individual drugs, their downside has already been discussed. But as combo, there is no additional uh, downside. Uh, now is a combination of RAS blockers with calcium channel blocking agents. And I've already mentioned when we say calcium channel blocking agents in the context of hypertension, we usually mean amlodipine. Now, we have combos like ACE inhibitors or ARBs, many ACE inhibitors and many ARBs with amlodipine combinations are available. And these are like perindopilin and amlodipine is available in one pill, Velsartan and amlodipine, Telmisartan and amlodipine. They are available in various strengths. All these three combo pills are available in at least three different strengths you could use whichever is appropriate for your patient. Of course, starting with the low dose and moving on to the high dose. The advantage is that you are giving more than one drugs, but in one pill. Uh, potent complementary blood pressure lowering effect and cancellation of side effects. And here I think, again, you know, uh, these calcium channel blocking agents also activate RAS. So activated RAS will be inhibited by RAS blockers. So that is how there will be complementary blood pressure lowering effect. And cancellation of side effect. Amlodipine is uh, known to cause pilar edema because of uh, predominant efferent vasodilatation. Pressure in the capillary increases. There is some uh, oozing of fluid outside the capillaries. But once we add uh, a ARB or ACE inhibitors like Velsartan, that would have effect on efferent vessels also. So blood going into the capillaries and going out of the capillaries both will increase. So pressure in the capillaries will be reduced and edema formation will also reduce. And similarly, uh, the microalbuminuria will also be reduced because that is also like pushing uh, protein into the interstitium. Uh, again, this combination, the chances of pedal edema are less. For example, if you use amlodipine 10 milligram alone, 
chances of pedal edema are more when we use amlodipine 10 mg with well sardon 160 for example but still those patients who are take, taking these combinations some of them they will develop pedal edema so that is a downside and if that happens then we will have to uh, make some adjustment uh, i think that we will discuss in some of the lecture triple combos now because you know these days uh, there is emphasis on giving combination pills that reduces pill burden so we have very nice triple drug combination also one of the ras blockers either ace inhibitors or arbs then calcium channel blocking agents which could which is amlodipine or then thiazide diuretic or thiazide type diuretic either hydrochlorothiazide or indepamide so we have this combination ACE inhibitors or ARBs plus CCB plus indepamide or hydrochlorothiazide and again various combinations are available in, 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 in one pill so those patients who are really refractory they should be given this triple drug combination most potent single pill combination I think that is a good feature and of course it enjoys all the benefits of individual drugs and then uh, pedal edema will still be a concern uh, although by adding diuretic the chances will be further reduced but I have seen some people still developing pedal edema but this pedal edema is not much of uh, an issue because this is just like a cosmetic abnormality although I understand it will be very hard for a patient to ignore it but uh, this pedal edema does not mean a serious uh, hemodynamic problem normally one would think that that there is a pedal edema this heart failure or liver failure or kidney failure but that is actually not the case but of course pedal edema is there we we need to fix it so that was all about the basic characteristics of various antihypertensive agents available now you must have noticed that i did not mention about some of the agents like i did not mention about alpha blockers i did not mention about hydralazine i did not mention about methyl dopa and there are other drugs also because these are not included in the first line those who are interested and they can read about them i hope i was able to give you some reasonable uh, baseline information about these drugs so that you can use them properly and you can select the proper agent for the proper patient when we have number of agents available that means there is a right there is one right for one patient i think we need to select that and please also watch my next video which is on the management of hypertension that will discuss how to use these drugs following various guidelines and i think i would like to say goodbye and thank you for watching this video and this is professor azizur rahman from madarstan thank you